First Presbyterian Church, where faith is nurtured, curiosity encouraged, diversity welcomed, and all are loved. Thank you for worshiping with us here today. I am Pastor Sue Collar. We have a lot of things that go on in the life of this church. Some are visible when you see what we do out in the community with our ministry partners. Uh, some are invisible. They are the things that uh, happen behind the scenes. I just want to give a shout out to our staff today. Most of their work you never see, but they are here every week, every day, making sure that this worship service gets put together for you so that you can worship on Sundays or whenever is convenient to you. So if you happen to see any of our staff around or want to send them a note, uh, do so. They've been putting in extra work to make sure that all of this happens. If this is your first time worshiping with us, please text hello to the number on the screen and let us know you're here. That gives us an opportunity to be in conversation with you, see how we could serve you during these times. If you would like to download a bulletin for today's sermon, you can, or the service, you can do that from our website at fpclincoln.org. The actual link is there on the screen for you. You can follow along with what we're doing and participate in the music and the prayers. During our prelude, you're going to see most of our announcements for what's going on here in the life of our church, but I wanted to highlight two of them right now. One is that I'm happy to say for the first time in a very long time, we have a, a, a small but mighty congregation in the sanctuary. We have about five people in here uh, who are joining us to watch us record worship today. If you would like to join us on future Fridays to watch the recording of worship, you are welcome to do so by reservation only. We're trying to uh, maintain the distance that we need to and the capacity of our room. So if you would like to be here on a Friday as we record worship, make a reservation with Carrie and she will put your name down and she'll fill you in on all of the requirements for those who attend, which includes wearing masks for the whole time. But on a personal note, it's just nice to have people in the sanctuary again. Now looking ahead, we're actually starting to think about Advent here. And you might remember on previous Advents and Lents, we have put together devotional booklets that are available for you to use every day as you go through that season. We're doing that again this year, so if you would like to write a devotion for inclusion in that booklet, we would welcome that. So please be in touch with Pastor Jane and let her know you'd like to volunteer. We're going to need about 40 or so uh, daily meditations, so volunteer for one, volunteer for two or three, uh, your choice. Jane can help you figure out how we do that, but we would love to have your meditations as part of our Advent daily meditation booklet. So the rest of what's going on, I'll let you read on the screen. And now, let us worship God.
Today we're going to be spending some time in the book of Exodus. It is the story of the journey of God's people from slavery in Egypt to freedom in the promised land. It was a difficult journey, and there were many times when they really thought they wanted to give up and go back to Egypt. They had a hard time keeping in front of them the picture of the promised land, this future that God had laid out for them, and they just weren't up for it at times. And we're going to hear a little bit about that today. But we also know what it's like to be them because we know what it's like to wrestle with change we don't want. We know what it is to fear losing things that are important to us. We know what it's like to, to be on a journey and, and not know really what the future is going to look like. Well, we are going to be exploring that today, and we're going to be hearing God's promises that can sustain us through this time of wilderness wandering and the journeys of our faith. So as we gather for worship today, let us seek God's strength and guidance, and let us join our voices together in song and praise. <laughs> as we gather to praise God, we bring with us a lot of weight and a lot of burdens. We bring with us the weight of things said and not said, the weight of hurts and pain, the weight of actions done and left undone. We bring with us the shame of those things. And that shame can get in the way of us living a full, faithful, joyful life with God. 
they can preoccupy our minds as well, so that even as we gather for worship, it is hard to be fully present. So we take this time in worship to lay those things down before God, to let that burden go, and to ask for forgiveness and to receive it. We do that knowing that the one we worship is the one who said, Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God of glory, we want to be fountains of hope for others. But sometimes our hearts are hardened. We would like to be transformed people, but our stubborn pride prevents us from bending a knee to you. We long to stand with those who are in need, but our selfishness keeps our backs rigid with judgment. Forgive us, God, who came down to us. Humble us that we might be true servants to the broken and lost. Split open our frozen hearts that compassion might flow freely to those who are hurting. Fill our minds with the presence of your Spirit that we might learn how to follow Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, into that kingdom of grace and hope. Amen. Friends, this is the good news. You are forgiven, and you are free, and you are made new. Let us embrace this forgiveness and complete God's joy by sharing forgiveness, compassion, and hope with everyone we meet. Now, should we ever happen to doubt just how deep God's love is for us, Look to Jesus Christ, for in Christ God became one of us for us, sinners though we are, walking by our side on this journey we call life and faith. And in Christ, God invites us to join with Christ that together we might be hope for the world. As we hear Paul's words in his letter to the Philippians, he talks about how God left the throne of heaven and came down to walk with us through this life. This scripture that we're about to hear is also considered by many scholars to be the very earliest Christian hymn. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing of the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, Make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for God's good pleasure. 
Our second reading is from the Old Testament book of Exodus, chapter 17. The entire book really is the story of the journey of God's people toward freedom. On the one hand, they left Egypt as slaves. They were to arrive in the promised land as free people. But that freedom doesn't come overnight. It's a journey and it's a process. And in the book of Exodus, we see what that is like for God's people. Multiple times, they wanted to turn around and go back because the way was just too hard. And the slavery they knew was more familiar and comfortable to them than the freedom they did not. One of those stories of wanting to turn back is what we are going to be hearing right now. So let's listen for the word of God for us today from Exodus 17. From the wilderness of Zin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock. The water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So this wasn't the first time they complained. Not the first time they ganged up on Moses and blamed him for absolutely everything bad that had ever happened to them since the moment they left Egypt. They had been promised in Egypt a land flowing with milk and honey. They'd been promised the opportunity to reap their own harvest of their own labor, to live lives of luxury. And sure, they must have realized that there'd be a, a bit of a trek to get from Egypt to the promised land, but it ended up being a lot harder than they had anticipated. These wilderness stories in Scripture are ones that we go back to time and time again. We continue to mind these wilderness stories because they resonate with our lives. Times are uncertain. The road ahead is dangerous. We don't fully know what awaits us on the other side of our current wilderness. Now, I'm guessing that there are some of you who think I'm talking about the wilderness of our global pandemic, or maybe the um, current election cycle that we're in the midst of. But even without that, we spend our lives moving in and out of uncertain times, facing dangerous roads and risky decisions. Rarely, if ever, do we have a clear path. Rarely, if ever, do we really know what that future holds. We may have what we hope for, but we certainly don't have a crystal ball. The road before us can often be discouraging. It can be scary, and it can be exhausting. It's not to say the wilderness is a totally bad place to be. Lots of joy happens in the wilderness. I, I think of the 40 years that the people of God spent in that wilderness between Egypt and the Promised Land. Babies were born in that wilderness. Marriages were celebrated in that wilderness. People grew up and discovered gifts and talents. Beautiful art was created. 
there are some wonderful things that happen in the wilderness. The wilderness is a wonderfully creative, exhilarating, and, and life-giving place to be. But we would be fooling ourselves if we did not also acknowledge that it can also be dangerous. It can be just plain hard. A marriage falls apart. A child is lost. A job is taken away. Sometimes when we deal with hardships and difficulties in our journeys, we just we accept them with, with resignation or sometimes depression. We, we just simply don't have enough uh, mental or physical resiliency to do anything else. Sometimes, though, we respond with anger and rage. In the wilderness, with Moses and the Israelites, Moses was a recipient of the Israelites' anger and rage. They were struggling, and this was tough. This was not what they expected. They were thirsty. I don't know when they last had water, but they saw no oasis on the horizon. They had no clue how long till they'd find fresh water again. And they finally turned to Moses. I mean, God may be leading them, but Moses is the one standing right there. And they did what human beings often do. They accused Moses of taking them out of Egypt only to let them die in the wilderness. Now, if they had if they'd stopped to think, they would have realized that that wasn't fair. But at that moment, they were tired, they were hungry, they were thirsty, and they didn't know what the future hold, what the future held for them. Moses feared for his life. We know that because what did he do? He goes to God and he said, they're about to stone me. They're about to stone me. He pleads for help. But you know something? Moses and the Israelites were both asking the same question. may not sound like it at first, but the issue wasn't whether there was water or not for the Israelites. The issue wasn't whether or not Moses would be protected from their anger. The question that they were both asking was a simple one. Is God with us or not? Is God among us or not? The Hebrew word for among is one of those rich, rich words with a lot of meaning there. It literally means in our inner organs. Is God with us? Does God see what's going on? Does God hear our cries? Does God care? Is God really with us? It's kind of like Moses was really asking, um, you know, Moses going to God and saying, look, your, your people, your people are about to shoot me with arrows. Are you with me or not? Are you going to stand with me or do I have to face them all by myself? The question was really, God, are you with me or not? Are you among us or not? Of course, God had an answer. The good news is that God heard and God did answer. God acted and God gave them water. Now think about that for a minute. I've read lots of scientific articles that try to figure out what was going on in this text. And in the wilderness of that area, underneath the outer layer of a rock, there is a very, very thin membrane of water. And so one of the theories is that when Moses hit the rock, he broke that membrane and water started to trickle out. I think they have so missed the boat on this one right here because this was not a trickle of water that came out of a few rocks. This was not even a, a small brook coming from the rocks out into the desert. This was a torrent of water. There were over 600,000 people who left Egypt. It was a torrent of water that God brought forth out of that rock to quench the thirst of God's fearful, thirsty people. God gave them a taste of the waters of life 
He gave them a taste of life in the promised land. When we are most vulnerable, when we are most desperate, when we are most angry, God gives us what we need to sustain us on the journey, but also to keep us going. God gives us what we need in the moment, but also what we need for the long haul. More about that in a minute. Because God was not done. God had one more thing to say to Moses, and to Moses was also to the whole people. I'm going to be standing right behind you. No matter what difficulties you face, no matter what the challenges are, yesterday it was hunger, today it's thirst, who knows what tomorrow will be, God says, I will be standing right there with you. I will be walking right there with you. That is the good news in this story, in this episode in the life of God's people. And it's an important message story for us to hear because we may not be in the wilderness of Zin. We may not be traveling from Egypt to the promised land, but many of us know what it's like to be in the wilderness. Each of us lives in a wilderness that is unique to us. We also live in a, in a wilderness that is, is common to our whole society and community. Our individual wildernesses are those things that are so personal to us that they may not even be seen by others. The losses we carry, the, the worries that weigh us down, the, the shame, the struggles that we deal with, the hope we've given up. You would not be alone if you have ever wondered, does God hear? Does God care? Is God with me? We don't always notice when we're in the midst of that wilderness that God is with us. But God always gives us what we need to make it through another day. That's part of the gift of wilderness. God gives in the wilderness. The water we are given may not look like a torrent that's going to flood the whole world, may not look like a, a raging river that's going to just bowl everybody over with its force and abundance. It may look like that friend who sits with us and helps us see that there's life after today. It may be a, a, a word of inspiration or a helping hand or a community of faith. But God still gives water in the wilderness. Because God is with us, and God does love us. Our communal wilderness is vast. As I was working on my sermon for today, I had the news on, and I was watching the, the protests going on in Louisville after the decision came down to not charge the officers in the death of Breonna Taylor. And I realized that I was hearing a wilderness story in that. Now, I need to say first, I'm not talking about the people who come to protest to loot and destroy. That's not what I'm talking about. But there is a community of people there who are crying out to God, who are quarreling with God and with our society, and saying, we want a better world. We, we have this vision of what the future can be, of what God has promised. They were longing for a world when no one needs to live in fear. And they wanted to know, not just does God see and hear, but they also want to know if you and I see and hear. Because they rightly recognize that you and I are the body of Christ. We are that presence that God chooses to work through in this world. And so they want to know, does the body of Christ hear and care enough to act and to join them on their wilderness journey to the promised land? And it is a wilderness journey. I was also thinking, how could I not, about the chaos in the political life around us. And I'll admit I'm a little angry with what I see because... I am just tired of us being more focused on hurting each other and winning than on 
acting for the common good. I long for the promised land. And the promised land I long for is the one that the prophets have talked about for centuries, a, a land where the wolf will die, lie down with the lamb, a, a, a land where we beat our swords into plowshares, those weapons of destruction we convert to tools for feeding and nourishing people. I long for rivers of healing water to flood our nation so that we could learn to be nice to each other again. I know it's possible because the prophets lifted it up as a gift from God, a vision and a hope. And I also know this is not out of our reach because this is the very mission that Jesus adopted when he spoke in the temple and started his ministry. Now, there have been times where we have seen glimpses of the promised land, whichever promised land we are hoping for based on our wilderness. But we've certainly seen glimpses of that promise when people can be nice to each other and put aside their differences and work for the common good. But so often what starts out well, those torrents of water, they seem to dry up really quick. And before we know it, we're right back to where we were lost in the wilderness without a vision and without out a hope for where we're going. But here's the thing. Even if it dried up, it was there. We saw it. We knew it was possible. If it was possible once, it's possible a second and a third and a fourth and a hundredth time. Those visions help sustain us as we travel through the wilderness. I had a conversation with Pastor Jock the other day about what he's working on in his Sudanese ministry. And he was talking about the fears of a new civil war in South Sudan because the peace that was agreed to has not been enacted there. And he was talking about this organization that he and others are starting to try to model for the people and the tribes in South Sudan what peace can look like, what forgiveness and reconciliation can look like. He has a vision of what's possible. The journey to get there is going to be challenging and difficult, and it's going to have its ups and its downs. But he has that vision to keep his hopes up. But even more than that, he knows God is walking this journey with him. He is not alone. Scholar Walter Brueggemann says, this story places God's powerful fidelity and attentiveness right in the middle of our human drama. This story places God's fidelity and attentiveness right in the middle of our wilderness walks. God is not waiting at the end of the journey for us to catch up and get there. God is with us right now in the midst of the wilderness, in the midst of pandemics and crazy elections, in the midst of whatever mess we're in or burdens we carry or battles we're fighting. God is with us, and God still brings water out of rocks. In a speech the day before he was assassinated, Martin Luther King Jr. said, we've got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop, I have seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. When Moses struck that rock and that torrent of living water burst forth, the people saw the promised land and they knew God was with them. The wilderness is a place of journeying from what was to what will be, from promise to promise fulfilled. And there's a reason it's called the wilderness. There are no paved roads. There are no straight paths. There are dangers. But it is not without God. And it is not without hope and promise. Friends, we are on a journey, each one of us, individually and together as a community. And sometimes that journey is absolutely wonderful and it just could not be easier and we just want to revel in the 
the beauty of whatever place we are in. But at other times, it is so difficult, we want to give up. We want to turn back. We want to go back to Egypt. We want to give up. In those moments, remember the promise God gave Moses. I am with you always. Not in some future reality, but right here and right now. So I encourage you in your wilderness journeys, look for torrents of living water when you are thirsty. Hold on to the vision of what we hope for, those promises of God. Know that you are not alone. And know that as you travel, God goes with you. And if God goes with you, you will reach the promised land. Oh, hi friends. Koala and I were just studying the scripture for this Sunday service. So come on in and join us for a little children's time, children's time. Gather round, gather round. We are here together, we are here together. Loving God, loving God. We were just reading out of the book of Philippians. Paul wrote this book to the people of Philippi. It was a letter to them. But really, God intended this message for all of us. Koala and I want to share a few of the words that we really liked in this scripture with you. Paul writes, Now make me completely happy. Live in harmony by showing love for each other. Be united in what you think. Mm, we talked about that last week, about how God says, to love one another as I have loved you. Hmm. Paul goes on to say that he doesn't want us to be jealous or proud, but be humble and consider others more important than yourself. Huh. Last week, we talked about the word humble. Do you remember Koala had on the humility hat last week? And we talked about that that meant that you don't think that you're better than others. That you know that we need other people. That we have to work together in order for God's message of love to be a part of this world. Well, that made me think this week about this flashlight. Now, we sometimes talk about God is the light of the world. And God gave me a lot of gifts. Um, and so I can use my gifts to spread his word and to spread light all over the world. So I've got this battery and I have on it the word me. Now this battery gives the electricity or whatever it needs, this flashlight needs to work. I don't really know exactly how that works. But I know that because God gave me gifts, I can help share those gifts with the world and get his message out to the world. So I'm just going to put me in the flashlight and I'm going to show you God's light of the world. If I can get that in there the right way. Yep, there we go. And we're going to spread, I am going to spread God's message. Hmm. No, because God gave me a lot of gifts and we put my energy in there. Hmm, maybe it doesn't work if it's just me. What do you think, Koala? Is there a problem there? Oh, what is it? Koala gets shy on camera. Koala said that I didn't read the scripture very good. That in the scripture, it talked about, I need you. So I have you on this battery. I need you. And I need others. I need like my other church family members. I need my neighbors. I need all those other people in order for God's message to get out to the world. 
So if we all work together, then it's gonna work. Oh, come on, I'm excited. Because Paul wants us to work together to give God's message to others. Oh, it's still not working. Uh, what is it? What? Oh. Oh, of course, why didn't I think of that? Koala says that we cannot forget this week and every week that it's going to take me and it's going to take you and it's going to take others always loving God, always learning about God's word and always caring that we are sending God's message and showing God's love to others. Oh my gosh, look what happened, everybody. I know I have it upside down while I'm putting the bottom on, but it worked. When we added God and when we added learning about God's words to you, and to me and to others, God's light will shine in this world. Let's all work on that this week, okay? Will you say a little prayer with Koala and I before we leave? Let's fold our hands. I'll say it and you say it after me. Dear God, dear God, I need you. I need you. I need others. I need others. We can work together. We can work together to shine, to shine your light, your light in the world, in the world. Amen, friend. Hey, thanks for joining Koala and I, and we'll see you next time on Children's Time, Children's Time. Bye-bye. As we come to our prayer time today, this is an opportunity to lift up to God those concerns that we carry with us, those wilderness stories we have. This is a time to offer up our fears as well as our hopes, our challenges as well as our joys. It is our time to both ask God, because God can handle it, are you with me? And is it, it is our time also to hear God say back to us, I hear you. I care, and I am with you. If you have any prayer requests that you would like to share with us, you'll see on the screen you can email or text your prayer request to us. You can email them to pray at fpcandlincoln.org or text the number on your screen. We'll share it with our prayer chain and lift your prayers and your joys up during this coming week. Let us come before God in prayer. 
Lord, on this journey of life, we spend so much of it in the wilderness. For we know that this world as it is is not the world we or you long for. We see injustice all around us. We see the results of sin in choices that harm us or others. At times it is so discouraging. So keep giving us torrents of living water that we may be reminded of what we're journeying toward. May that help us be faithful to the journey even as you are faithful to us. Paul reminded us that you took on our flesh to be with us in a way never before seen. On this journey of life, you do indeed walk with us. You see our struggles and our pain, our hungers and our thirst. Thank you for not leaving us to navigate this wilderness alone. Today, we lift up some of what we thirst for. We pray that justice may flow down like a mighty river and fill this land so that in our speaking and listening and in our action, no one need be afraid and that all will know themselves to be respected and loved. We pray for a healing of our civic life together, that the vision of swords being beaten into plowshares, the vision of weapons and words of destruction being turned towards things that nurture and sustain might turn hearts so that we can live in peace with each other even if we don't share the same mind. We pray for those who literally find the wilderness a dangerous place as they face wildfires. Let them know you are with them. Please keep everyone safe. We pray for those who have finally made it to the ultimate promised land for the family and friends of Jack Honig and all others who have passed from this life to the next. And we pray for those who face illness or surgeries, that you may be with them and with their nurses and doctors, that healthy outcomes may be had. And lest we forget that the wilderness can also be a place of blessing, thank you for answered prayers and for healing. Thank you for births and marriages. Thank you for beauty. And we give thanks for you who opens our eyes to the grace around us. As we travel this journey to the promised land, we know that we travel it with you, God of the wilderness. And so in the confidence of that assurance, we pray together the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I have something really exciting to share with you all today. This past week, We have had a film crew here at the church. We have invited them in to make some videos for us to talk about who we are as a church, about our faith values that form us and shape what we do, so that we can use these videos to share the story of who we are with others who are seeking a faith home, with others who are looking for a place where they can belong, a place where it's safe to ask questions and have doubts, people who are looking for someone to walk this journey of faith with them. These videos that are, that are in process now would not be possible if it weren't for some very spe- uh, specific, special gifts from some of you. You might remember from some of the mailings we've sent out that one of the priorities we have set for our church is to build a robust online ministry so that we can reach people who maybe aren't physically able to come to our building, but who are looking for what we have, who are looking for these companions to walk with them. And so some of you have given money and said, this is important. Will this help? Well, because of those gifts, we've been able to do these videos. And when they're done, probably about November or so, we'll be sharing them with you, and we hope you will share them with your friends and your your social circles. Because I can guarantee you, we got something great here. 
God is doing amazing things here. And there are people you know who don't know that yet. And maybe this will help them know that there's a place for them here, whether in person or online. If you want to be a part of this church making a difference in the lives of others, if you want to be a part of us sharing God's love and good news with others, you can do that. You can volunteer. You can help with worship. You can give money because it takes all of us working together and all of our resources to touch as many lives as possible. So you should be seeing on the screen various ways that you can give monetarily to the church. I encourage you to do that if you are moved and are able. They make a difference, and there simply are things that we cannot do without your financial support. And so I thank you for that. And if you want to volunteer, get in touch with Carrie. We've always got things people can do. And sometimes it's good just to get your hands dirty and just to physically do something and know that you're connecting that way. Again, be in touch. Let us know how you want to be a part of the work here. And we will see how we can also serve you on your journey. As we conclude our worship here, we only conclude it in this space, in this format. Our worship continues as we go out into the world. Because in our worship, we proclaim to others who God is and what God has done. And we celebrate what God is doing in the wilderness. So go out, look for those torrents of living water, direct people to them because there are thirsty people out there and help everyone have that hope that they need to make it through to the next day and the next and the next. We are the body of Christ. This is our calling. And I know you will do it for you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are the people of God. And yes, God goes with you.